a many it was it seemed very clear that Mr. Holness presented a much more composed figure, a much more, um, I suppose, much more relatable. I think that was his biggest asset. And he has paid attention in recent times to personal grooming, physical appearances, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Those things are important considerations. And I put it to you that the, these aesthetic qualities are things that the PNP and their delegates will be taking into consideration when making the determination. And I can say, I, I, I put it to you that Mark Golding versus Lisa Hanna, you are going to see certain changes coming from Mark Golding, for example, as he goes up against the 1993 Miss Universe. <laughs>
So I think that that could be, have been a factor. So let's, to, let's put a couple of things in, 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 in the mix then. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, there's a question of importance of incumbency. You look mm -hmm. at how the incumbents have been dealing with this particular issue and other matters. And then you look at whether there is sufficient basis on which to switch to another set of managers in these circumstances. You add to that now the question of messaging and how did they, those challenging to take on this position, how did they convey their message and how did the incumbents deliver their own message to say, well, we are actually the better option in these circumstances in particular. And then, so it is a question of the content, but also the packaging of the message. All of those things would have gone into consideration and would have affected the decision of the voters ultimately coming out with this rather unbalanced outcome, as Carlet suggested. The interesting thing, though, that we need to consider is that even though the JLP won such a huge majority, it has done so, first of all, with only 37% of the voters mm -hmm. turning up. And when you disaggregate the share for the PNP and the share for the JLP, I think the JLP comes up with about 21% of that. So if you stop to think about it, you understand that this is an outcome with lots of asterisks beside it, both for the victors and the losers. Indeed. And if I may ask, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, Carly, go ahead. Oh, I'm going to move on and ask you. Go ahead. Because I, I certainly don't discount the fact that COVID had a profound effect on the election. But had the elections been called a little earlier, before the COVID crisis hit, do we think that the JLP would have still had a decisive victory based on how the economy was doing and in spite of how poorly they were doing on crime? And would they have had a decisive victory based on the fact that the People's National Party had, has, and seems to will have for the foreseeable future a leadership crisis? I think that you are onto something when you take us back to... Um, say even a year ago, the PNP was coming out of a very divisive uh, leadership election. Those rifts were never fully healed. Mm -hmm. And the attempts at conveying, and we come back to the question of messaging again, the, the, the attempt at conveying unity um, sort of got short-circuited run about May when there was the leaking of that letter to the opposition leader expressing some concerns, which I, I can't say that were not genuine and legitimate concerns on the part of those who wrote the letter. The fact is, however, that it gave, it conveyed to the Jamaican public the view that, well, all is still not well. And again, it comes back to the question of how do you communicate internally, externally, et cetera? And what, do you, what lessons do you gain from history? Because what you're seeing in the PNP in 2020 is, in a sense, JLP 2.0 in terms of what happened with the JLP in the 1990s. And that period of severe divisions, fissures that helped to keep the JLP in the wilderness for four consecutive terms. So, does the PNP want to fully emulate the JLP from a generation ago, or do they want to learn the lessons and immediately fix those problems they're having, including the question of how they communicate? Um, All right. So, it's a funny thing that you mentioned the thing, mentioned asterisk when it comes to this particular election. Why? Because I count myself as one of the apathetic voters in Jamaica, in that for a long time, I really wasn't interested in the political process. And call it, maybe you can back me up on this one. There always seemed to be a focus more on hype over substance. But it seemed like, for me, it seemed like more effort was spent on energizing the party faithful 
with rallies mm -hmm. and motorcades and so on. And politicians seem more, interested, seem more interested in getting her forward than discussing the relevant issues related to running the country. The question I have, Earl, is how long has this been a feature of our politics and why has it lasted so long? It don't seem to make any sense to me. It, it has always been a feature of our politics. And let's not kid ourselves. Have you ever, have you ever looked at the U.S. Democratic and Republican uh, presidential campaigns and their, their conventions, for example, and all of the crazy hats and all the, the things that people um, turn up in? They're not really turning out for much substance either. You know, They are turning up for the hype. However, there are calm, reflective persons who will ultimately um, be voting on issues. So you have to cater to both of them. But let me take you back in history mm. to um, how we started and the personalities of the two major figures of Jamaican um, politics in the early days. You had Norman Manley, the very serious, some say almost too serious, um, introspective, reflective kind of person, an attorney at law, who had lost mm. his brother during World War I, and so had gone through a period of, of depression. And that was the kind of individual whose conscience or public consciousness was stirred in the 1930s by what he saw happening around him in terms of the social situation. He had founded Jamaica Welfare even before the founding of the PNP in the wake of the 1938 uprising. Then there was his cousin, Alexander Bustamante, who was much more gregarious, much more charismatic, much more a man, man of the people. people. So, yes. Yeah. So it was not particularly surprising that Bustamante, who was, if you want to say, might have been the hype master of his days, that he led the JLP to victory in the first election under universal adult suffrage in 1944. So much so that Norman Manley did not even win his own, the seat that he contested in 1944. It took him five years, he was out of, he was out of parliament for five years, or he did not gain entry into parliament for five years. Then fast forward to 1955. So he lost 1944, lost in 1955, in 1949, and then, there was a third election. By now, he was getting pretty desperate, I suspect. Oh, wow. And he, at that point, um, the, he had always tried to be issues-oriented in his campaigning. And he had so many issues to take to the people in terms of nation building and all of that. But there was an incident. He was coming from a trip overseas with his wife, Edna Manley. And he was met at the wharf, at the port, by a throng of PNP supporters. And during his absence, they had come up with this strategy, this slang. And guess what it was? It was, sweep them out. <laughs> that is something that you yeah. should, that should be very familiar yes. to because yes. it was used the other day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This was 1955. Yeah. Nothing and it was a very catchy, catchy slang at the time, but Norman Mandy frowned on it because he thought it was trivial. Mm. And so he had, mm. at first he wanted nothing to do with it. But then Edna said to him, essentially, oh, Norman, just lighten up. The people, <laughs> the, the, the people want you to, 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 to show that you are like one of them. And he stopped and he thought about it for mm. a little while. And then eventually he grabbed hold of one of the brooms that they were proffering and said, okay, let's sweep them out. And he actually did the motion of the sweeping. <laughs> and his campaign sort of caught fire from there. So I'd say it, it messaging- Even without social media, look at- Even that. without social media, this was 1955. Mm. Late, late 54, 55, the, the election was early 55. And so that, that yes, was 19, yes. that, so, so that, that was Norman Manley. Then they went through, so the PNP won two consecutive elections, 55 yeah. and 59. Mm -hmm. Then lost the, lost the federation referendum, lost right. the 1962 election, lost in 1967. By then again, they were desperate. 
And here comes Norman Manley's son, Michael Manley, nicknamed right. Joshua. And in 1972, Michael Manley, aided by some supreme marketers such as Desmond Henry, who later became director of tourism, I they really launched the, the bandwagon. Yeah. Because I had yeah. those questions coming out. But continue. I mean, this is good stuff. Continue. No, no. Well, no, you can interrupt me. But, uh, but my point is that it, you, you saw the transition from the, from, the fifth, from the 40s to the 50s through the 60s and into the early 70s. Let me double back a little bit and say that in the 60s, even after Bustamante had essentially retired, he was so dominant in the Jamaica Labour Party that if you go back and look at the, the Gleaner advertisements for upcoming JLP events, like they were having a national broadcast on radio or TV, and they would put an ad in the paper featuring whichever speaker it was that would be doing the national address. In the top right hand or left hand corner would be a picture of the chief, Buster, because it was important to him and to them that he continued to be the symbolic head of the Jamaica Labour Party. So again, the question of um, imagery, showing dominance, who is the leader, who is the maximum leader, etc. That was very important to them. The personality cult, mm -hmm. so to speak, in Jamaica was well and truly on right. way back then. So, Carl, I'm, I'm going to get to you in a second, but Earl, what is your personal view on this approach that party members take to selling their selling? I mean, it almost, for me, it seems like the notion of energizing the base has taken on a life of its own over the years and become, this, become something completely different than anybody else could have ever imagined. I mean, the motorcades with people half out the window, the painting dark green, the, the painting goat <laughs> green, putting animal in clothes, you know what I mean? And I understand it has a place, but it has become almost pure spectacle. And I think for me and persons, I like to think persons in my age group, age cohort, it's a turn off. You know what I mean? I, you know, I get the need for, for it to a certain degree, but it is a turn off. So what is your personal view? Where do you come down on the whole well, presentation of it? If, if it is a turn off for you, then can you imagine then what it might be doing for um, persons like me who are a bit ahead of you in terms of um, our lifespan. Because even though I look back with nostalgia at some of what I described to you in terms of, I, I mean, the 1972 election, I was seven years old. Mm. So this was my first um, awakening to something called election. In fact, when I heard that, that the... Um, name of the Prime Minister then was Shearer. I wondered, well, what is it that he's sharing? Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm a naive little seven-year-old and I'm wondering, what is this about? But, but I, my point is that that particularly colourful campaign it served a purpose for me as a, as a small child. It got me interested now, clearly, I wouldn't have been interested in issues at that time. I was just interested mm -hmm. in the excitement. So there is a place for the vibes. There is a place for drumming up um, excitement in the society and in the communities, getting people turned on to go out and vote. But you also have to find a way to share serious messages with them. And one of the things about that controversial 1970s period is that it was a period of political education, some might say indoctrination, or whatever it is, you had masses of people meeting in classrooms, um, being educated about mm -hmm. political history, about ideology. You had mm -hmm. counter, um, counter sessions, I mean, Counter propaganda sessions, if you want to call it that, from the Jamaica Labour Party. Mm -hmm. You had, as pa almost part of the culture of the time, the emphasis on adult, adult literacy. Mm -hmm. And so you had mm -hmm. the Jamal classes. And so many of the so called grassroots people were actually being taught to read and write and to reason and to have a better understanding 
of some of the important national policy issues. So you can have both things. And in this era of um, social media, you can use social media to convey serious, important messages while also doing the dub play thing. All right. So, Carl, there's clearly a lesson there for us as individuals, um, business operators, persons looking to sell ourselves, our ideas, and so on, in terms of the value of, of energizing your audience, your, yes. your target audience, even as you don't play your objectives as a business. Talk to me. What does that say <laughs> to you, based on the example you see that? We, it's, it's clear in the political process. What does that say to you? Yes, yeah, very clear in the political process. And you are right. Individuals are exactly that. They are individual. And in order to get some to move, you need to have that, that base kind of movement. And in order to get others to move, you need to have that intellectual kind of movement. So in the business world, we know that the key message needs to get through, whether it is going on a painted goat <laughs> or it's going through a manifesto or some other form of document that people are going to sit down and dissect. The election process is really remarkable because like you, you're not going to see me hanging outside of a bus, but I will be there at every debate with my popcorn listening <laughs> to every word that the candidates say. And, and one of the things that I appreciate about our elections in Jamaica, as, as Earl has alluded to, yes, we have that energizing of the base, but our political parties, I think, also, for lack of a better word, pander to the articulate minority in providing content and information to them. How well they did that in this last election is another story, uh, because I think the debates, for example, brought a different perspective. The debates did not end up the way I thought it would end up, the first debate. Um, Arguably, no party won it, but rather an individual won that debate. The second debate with the, the finance minister and the shadow minister, we thought that it might have been a clean sweep, but I think fairly evenly matched. And then, of course, the leadership debate, uh, people expected a different outcome based on how it is that Dr. Peter Phillips was coming into the race, having come back from an illness, having come back from a leadership challenge, having been basically on the ropes, but still held his own in, in many ways. So I like the fact that both in business and in politics, we recognize that Jamaicans are a unique set of people who are very individual and we have to appeal to them in different ways. All right, let me switch back to you, Earl. Now, that 18-year stretch where the PNP was in power, I was perhaps a little too young to understand it myself, but I would like to hear from both you and Carly. Why the are you assuming that I'm old enough? Actually, I'm <laughs> you are yeah, a little bit more ahead of me, but you, you, can, um, you can appreciate what kind of effort yeah. it takes to win an election and sustain a message that is relevant or relatable to people over that period of time. I mean, each in the, I, I suppose you can make the argument that each election was its own thing, and so winning it had its own set of, set of factors. But it's really rare to see that long stretch. And, you know, people can turn on you very yes. quickly. So what do you think accounted for that, that the PNP is being able to sustain or keep a message or relate to the public consistently over that period? There are several factors. I alluded to some of them, to one of them earlier, meaning the fact that the JLP under Edward Siaga made it relatively easy for Mr. Patterson to transition from the Michael Manley period into his own. He came into his own and was able to uh, overcome whatever the JLP threw at him because the JLP was fractured and eventually it gave rise to the establishment of the National Democratic Movement in 1995, which contested the 1997 election, welcomed by many people who saw it as an important third option. They hoped it would have been a viable third option. Ultimately, it defeated out for various reasons. But let's go back to 1989. The JLP had had a two-term run up to then, the two parties had been sharing two terms right, right. each. Um, in 1989, the PNP came back under Michael Manley. The JLP had taken Jamaica through a period of mostly austerity because of how severe the economic crisis was in the late 1970s into the early 1980s. Then we were hit by a number of economic, additional economic shocks in the 1980s, such as the fallout 
in Boxet Alumina. The, the Alpart, for example, was closed for many years during the 1980s. Sounds very familiar to us today again. Right. So the 1980s was a period of economic stabilization and austerity. Yes, some important groundwork was, was laid for future growth, and there was some amount of growth. But the truth is that the people came out of the 1980s with JLB and Siaga fatigue. They relished the return of Joshua, as some lovingly called Michael Manley, but by 1989, he was hardly in his Joshua with a rod of correction mode. He was a far more sober and mature Michael Manley who was essentially trying to, um, to show that he understood the new realities. Unfortunately, in terms of his own well-being, he was not able to continue very long into that new era. So he retired due to ill health in early 1992. And then came P.J. Patterson. In 1992, P.J. Patterson was, I think, 57 going on 58. Even not, ironically, he was able at that point to market himself as the Fresh Prince. You may <laughs> recall that the Fresh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air was yeah, a, a yeah, popular yeah, TV yeah. hit at the time. So I he also was able remember to, a Black Man Time now. Well, I'm coming to that, Black he, Man Time. He no. was able to market himself as being the Young Prince, um, the Fresh Prince, and also was able to pull for the Young, Gifted, and Black song. That was a theme song for him in 1992, 1993. The thing about Black Man Time was that Jamaicans had up to that point, except for the period in which Hugh Shearer was prime minister, unelected, because he succeeded Sir Donald Sangster, who died suddenly in 1967. Up to that point, Jamaica had not had a prime minister who was, um, I, I don't know how best to describe it, but not uh, clearly not as obviously black as the majority of the Jamaican people. In mm. fact, I think, so I think during the 1993 campaign, Mr. Patterson said at one point that if I walked off the stairs and, and off the, the, the stage and joined you down there, there will be no difference between you and me. And so that became, a, that became a significant factor in that election. Some saw it as a positive, some saw it as a negative. It was a rather nasty election campaign because Mr. Oh, wow. Siaga, then um, speaking of Mr. Patterson and, and scandals, like under the PNP or, or Mr. Patterson, do, uh, the, the, the use of the term black scandal bag oh. um, was raised by him. Wow. And that became wow. very very controversial. He also um, spoke of, spoke of um, purebred versus mongrel dogs. Wow. So that wow. was, yeah, that, that, that became part of, and in fact, in one of Mr. Patterson, in, in Mr. Siaga's uh, memoir, Pure which bread. was published around about 2010, 2011, he actually said he regretted one of those um, terms that he used. I don't remember which one mm. particularly it was, mm. but I did interview, I did, I did question him about that. So I'm saying to you mm. that in terms of messaging, that it was very controversial, both in terms of Patterson's message and Siaga's response yeah. to Patterson. Mm -hmm. And so that laid, the, that kind of laid the foundation for why, I mean, I, I asked because I know that many persons are, I guess they're divided as to whether or not it was that people rallied behind Mr. Patterson's leadership or was it so much that the PNP was just able to win elections? They just knew how to mobilize their, 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 their different resources oh, to ensure that they won on the ground, that they won the ground battle so that they secured more ballots, et cetera, et cetera, relative to whether it was Mr. PG and his likability, the fact that he was the black prime minister, the brilliant coming from humble origins back in Hanover, you know, that side of the country. So, you know, over that 18 year stretch, where does Organi it really organizational, organizational superiority was a hallmark of that period for the PNP. PJ Patterson had been chairman of the PNP. He had been a vice president of the PNP. He knew organizational work down to a T as they said. 
and he was supported by some significant and influential figures along his journey who knew how to do that groundwork, which apparently the JLP has now mastered themselves and the PNP seems to have lost that script. So there's no question about it, that being able, being well organized on the ground was an important factor for the PNP during that period. But you can never um, underestimate the significant blow that this unity in the JLP dealt to that party's chances and what an advantage it gave to the PNP during that period. You had the Gang of Five affair leading into the 1993 election. So much so that Carl Samuda, who has been impregnable in North Central <laughs> St. Andrew, left the JLP, joined the PNP, and still managed to retain that seat while running on the PNP ticket in 1993. By 1997, he was back with the JLP and won it again and has, and has won it, continued to win it ever since. But the, right. then you had the even bigger split in 1995 with Bruce Golding, the heir apparent to Edward Siaga, leaving in frustration, taking a significant chunk of the JLP me um, membership with him, certainly in terms of persons of influence in the party, forming the NDM. And that, of course, he got 30 odd thousand votes, the NDM in 1997. Now, if you think about that spread across each constituency, it might not seem to be a lot, but when you take a few thousand here and a few thousand there across several constituencies, it made all the difference. So the PNP won again in 1997 uh, by a, a massive majority. And that continued all the way up until 2002, when Bruce Golding returned to the JLP in September, I think it was, and combined his forces with Mr. Seaga once again. And they were able to take the JLP within shouting distance, so to speak, of the PNP. They lost, but the signs were good that they mm -hmm. finally had found their mojo once again and could mount a serious challenge next time, which ultimately they did under Mr. Golding's leadership in 2007 winning for the first time since 1983. So, Carly, I, mean, um, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to mm -hmm. get you in, in terms of your perception of this 18-year stretch and what lessons you can take away from it, from leadership and organization and, and so yes. on, messaging. I, I think the word that resonates with me after listening to Earl, of course, is leadership because I, I don't think I, I contemplated how important leadership is. I mean, obviously leadership is important, but in, in every case that we have looked at so far in terms of the election, we have seen where either there was strong leadership or an absence of strong leadership, which led one or the other party to win the election at the time. And uh, I had perceived at the time, of course, that Mr. P.J. Patterson was a strong leader. I remember when I think... PMP won an unprecedented fourth term. And I remember watching the, him, his acceptance speech and all the duration and stuff. And I, I thought to myself at the time that he is sure and he is steady. And that is why the, the people had voted for him. And then when Portia Simpson came along, people liked her quite a bit. And she had quite a bit of likability as a leadership. So if there are criticisms that she wasn't the most effective leader in terms of, of how she did things. She certainly had that likability factor. And then here comes Mr. Golding, who demonstrated himself as smart and, and capable and such. And again, the, the perception of the electorate as who they wanted to be leader swung quite heartily. But I want to make a point as well. For better or worse, I believe, rightly or wrongly, that elections are won by the base, because the base are the people who go out to vote. You, Vaughn, you mentioned that you are turned off by the, the, all that appeal. And a number of people, the, the intellectual minority, may feel the same way. But it is just as important for, and I'll put myself in that category, for us to vote. Part of the reason that the, the politicians pander to the base more than anybody else is because the base Votes. And it's wonderful that people like us may have more money to donate and businesses and, and things of that to, to make it happen. But at the end of the day, all our money means nothing if we don't go out and vote. And I don't think that 
it's the party's responsibility. I think it's us as citizens to say to ourselves that not because personally I live in Carl Samuda's constituency and I know there's a lot of apathy. People who may or may not support him say, boy, it's a safe seat. So it don't make sense to vote. How do we rock that perception in persons who are not part of the base? How do we energize people to not be apathetic towards elections? And as as Earl pointed out, 37% of the electorate turned out, of which I was one. How do we get more people to vote? All right. So let me switch tack just a little bit, Earl, to come back to something that you made reference to. So after 18 years in power, people voted in the JLP in 2007. They had one term and the PNP came back for another term in 2011. Then the JLP won again in 2016. Pondi suggests that the sequence here was that the people needed that change after 18 years and voted out the PNP in 2007. They came back on board and voted them back in after the JLP's term. And then the JLP started getting better at messaging, culminating with two consecutive terms. What do you say, Earl? As, as you can, from what I remember, the JLP really started to take an advantage in terms of messaging and connecting with ads on social media and the different things like that. And that was what helped them, to see, that seemed to give them the advantage. Do you think that was what happened? I think the JLP was able, first of all, to dispense with this unity after Andrew Holness staved off a challenge by uh, Audley Shaw in 2013. There was also related to that issue, the question of the senators, the JLP senators and the signed resignation letters, etc., that caused quite a stink in the JLP at the time and the society looking on at that point. People were really, really upset. And the, the matter of the Senate seats went all the way to court. And it was a court that settled the matter. And then Mr. Holness publicly apologized. I think it was at a church service. It might have, it might have been at, at Boulevard Baptist Church. I think, I don't want to be held to the specific church, but I seem to recall that he actually publicly apologized for the role he had played in terms of that public display of this unity. Uh, some might even say duplicity uh, in, in some of what went on. After that, the JLP was able to come together. They certainly, the, the prospect of an electoral victory certainly con concentrated the mind. And so they went into the 2016 election very much focused on winning and having convinced the people that they had put the disunity behind them. So you come back to the question of messaging. Obviously, they were doing something right. And with each passing year, and, and Carla knows this better than, than either of us in terms of the advancing technology and the use of various platforms, the JLP has obviously been better at the PNP in terms of keeping with the times, the changing times and the use of technology. And somehow they have been able to sharpen their message on these various platforms and have been able to attract and hold some persons who were not so sure about which other parties to throw in their lot with. Mm -hmm. The JLP has been able to make significant inroads into traditional PNP territory, not just on the ground in terms of physically going out there, but in terms of influence across these platforms. And so I would say that the PNP lost momentum. Had it won the election in 2016, maybe we would be having a completely different conversation now. Because I suspect, for example, that Andrew Holness would not now be the leader of the Jamaica Labour Party because they would have gone through their own tumultuous standing. Right. So winning elections, very, very important. I mean, I, one of the things that you keep stressing, and I suppose it's a lesson that everybody else can pay attention to, is unity in terms of presenting a united front. Whatever you're presenting, um, I mean, as a company, as an individual, make sure that everything you suggest or you portray is well put together with no hint of um you know 
I guess, lack, for lack of a better word, like seriousness. You know what I mean? Make sure that everything you say is consistent. Make, make sure that everything that you're putting forward is, is can stand up to scrutiny. Look, I think, I think Jamaicans will forgive most things. What they see not to be tolerant, tolerant of is this unity in a political organization. Uh, we spoke earlier on about Norman Mandel leading the PNP to two consecutive losses in the early days of our political journey and then winning in 1955. It wasn't just a sweeping out slogan in 55 that, that, that helped him. It was, in fact, that he dealt with the problem, a perception that the PNP had communists in the party. Rightly or wrongly, that was holding him back. And there were people in a particular group. So there, there were cleavages in the party. And what did he do? Fairly or unfairly, he got rid of the infamous four H's, four significant members of the party, intellectual giants in their own right. But they were far to the left of Norman Manley, who was a Fabian socialist, but these were persons who were far to his left. And he, got, he expelled them from the party. He got them expelled from the party. And that was 1952, which gave them three years of healing to do until the election in 1955. So you can have this unity, but you have to deal with it early in the electoral cycle. So when the, J when the PNP had a, had a leadership challenge in 2019, and that carried over into 2020, it was almost inevitable that they would have lost. So unity, that term is, is more than a word. I don't know. For me, though, I almost feel like I don't agree with you. Why? Because for me, I don't know that the unity was an issue. I mean, in the sense that, to me, just personally, in yes. terms of grading the messaging and the messages, what's the, the, the part of that, I suppose, it just I, I would agree with the pundits that it seemed like messaging was more, more effective, but the JLP's message was just more effective. It was you know more, I mean? No, no, no. It, it was more effective, but also remember that your message, your message in terms of clarity is enhanced when it is not clouded with perceptions of disunity. So whatever Peter Bunting, Mark Golding, Peter Phillips, Julian Robinson, whatever some of the major figures in the PNP were saying in 2020, people were asking the question, can we trust them to lead us effectively after this election, especially considering the challenges that face the country? I put it to you that if the JLP had not resolved its issues between 2013 and 2016, that it would not have won that election, never mind the significance of the 1.8 proposal that came late in the day in 2016. Mm -hmm. So, all right, all right. Mm -hmm. Carla, what, what, what say you? Was unity are our, our, our messaging? Are both our, our, our king, like a percentage? Yes. Where do you come it, from? It, it, it sal is a conflation of different things without a doubt. But I agree with Earl from the perspective of unity being important because if I can't be confident that the leader that I vote in has the support of his party. If I have doubts as to whether the members of the party are going to be self-serving over nation serving, right, because they want to jostle for the position, then I'm not going to elect them. It, it's a reality for me because I need to make sure that whoever I elect as leader is going to do what I need them to do with my best interest as a citizen and not be sabotaged by their, by their own cohort. So unity is, is very important. And I noticed that in that first debate, there was a lot of emphasis on leadership on one side and less so on the other side to the point that it, it became a cause for discussion. Why is it that the three people who were on the podium didn't refer to their leader, didn't big up their leader, did not show deference to their leader? And right then and there, it so doubt in minds of many people, myself included, that these three, and certainly one of the three, um, may have some other ambitions. Okay, which brings us to the issue of you know, leadership, the very faces of the individual parties and 
their own, the assets that they brought to the election. I mean, for many, it was, it seemed very clear that Mr. Holness presented a much more composed figure, a much more, um, I suppose, much more relatable. I think that was his biggest asset, is how relatable he came across relative to Dr. Phillips. So, and at what point? During the debate or, or generally? Just generally speaking, I think okay. the, his likability factor, uh, you know, Brogad, I mean, you know, I don't think Peter Phillips doesn't have any such manica, you know what I mean? And the Clarks thing and, and just the connection that he was able to make with the population just hit some notes. Some people could see it and think it's trivial, but for many people, as you said, energizing the base, energizing the population and getting there to, to see him in a light that it's relatable, even, but when he's on the podium, he's respectable and he's very prime ministerial. So I think he took an advantage of that. What say you, Earl? No, there's no question about that, that he... He has learned. He has grown in that position, both as leader of the JLP and as prime minister. He is not, he was not a naturally charismatic figure, mm. but he has, he has certainly learned and he has grown and he is packaged and marketed properly, effectively. Mm. And he has enablers, and I use that term not in a negative sense, he has enablers around him who see to it that he's shown in his best possible light. And he has paid attention in recent times to personal grooming, physical appearances, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Those things are important considerations. And I put it to you that the, these aesthetic qualities are things that the PNP and their delegates will be taking into consideration when making the determination. And I can say, I, I, I put it to you, that Mark Golding versus Lisa Hanna, you are going to see certain changes coming from Mark Golding, for example, as he goes up against the 1993 Miss Universe. Miss World. <laughs> Carlet, Carlet, oh, jump in real quick. What say I, you? I agree wholeheartedly with that comment. And I, I want to add the point too that Dr. Peter Phillips, before the election cycle started, I felt, and I'm no political pundit, I can't say that I'm off fair on all the political news, but certainly as an elector, as a, as a citizen, I felt that ahead of the election time, we, we kind of felt an election coming from January or even before, mm -hmm. I felt him largely absent. I did not see him. Partly it was the leadership crisis that was happening within the party. Part of it might have been his illness and his late admission that he had suffered from illness and was recovering and all of that. Part of it may have been something else. But I remember thinking, wait a minute, where is the leader of the opposition? I haven't seen or heard him in, in a number of activities for a long, long time. And I saw all the the, the spokesman instead of him. And it raised a flag in my mind. So I, I think that was part of it as well. Yes, um, Prime Minister Andrew Holness has certainly stepped up, but also I saw an absence, not just a crisis, but an absence in leadership on, on the side of the PNP. And to agree again with Earl's point, Dr. Peter Phillips is an intelligent man, without question, yes? But his physical appearance does not denote as, as PJ Patterson did. P.J. Patterson, as Earl mentioned, was 58 or so, but still came across as the Fresh Prince. He still seemed youthful and healthy and such, whereas Dr. Peter Phillips doesn't have that same image. So he may be smart and he may be a good leader and all of those things, but his, his just appearance and image isn't everything, but it is a lot, simply could not stand up to the, the youthful, well-groomed... Um, well Some put together, say, and uh, some would say well even manicured. <laughs> yeah. Some would say even yeah. manicured presentation that Andrew Holness had. Talk to me about the Perfect. notion that Earl just said about the enablers and how they, how do you think that is working in terms of, because I mean, it does seem he has a good team around him. So talk yes, to me about yes, the importance yes. of the team and crafting your image as a leader. Well, as a public relations professional, <laughs> certainly I believe that having a good team can, can make a good leader stand out better. So a, a PR team enablers can't make someone, can't make a leader who is not a good leader look good, but certainly can enhance, you know, it's like makeup. You can look good without makeup, but if you have on makeup, you look better. 
uh, depending on how you dress and these things. So the enablers, some of whom I know quite well and think are excellent in, in what it is they do, can put the frame on the picture to make the picture more attractive. But at the end of the day, the substance of the person must be there. People refer to PR people as spin doctors. Yes, we frame things mm. to look better. But if it doesn't look good in the first place, we can't make, we can't put lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. Yeah, which is why, which is why I, I made mention of the um, Mark Golding versus Lisa Hanna contest that is in the offing. What you will see, and, and there's no question about it, Carlet, that Mark Golding has the substance. And what he will need yes. is for that group of enablers around him to guide him properly to the extent that he needs guidance and for him to allow them to assist him properly in the same way that she will also need support and guidance in some, in, in, in some respects. So you cannot dismiss those issues, those things that make for the complete package. I like the metaphor of the framing of the picture mm. because certainly an attractive photograph or painting without the frame, without a, a, a good frame, is not quite as attractive as when it is properly framed. And that is what I think the, those who are aspiring to leadership need to understand. I recall when Dr. Phillips was younger and relatively new on the, on the scene in terms of politics and leadership in the early 1990s. He was then very, very engaging. And he was attractive to a lot of young people. Many young people were drawn to him and they were drawn to his um, intellect. They were drawn to him for the fact that he was he was somebody they could share their points of view with. And he had many sessions with people at different various levels of the society. And I think that that version of Peter Phillips would have been more successful than the 2020 version of Peter Phillips. Mm -hmm. And I'm not blaming him for everything. I'm just saying yeah. that sometimes time does catch up with you. If you go back to 2006, when he challenged for the leadership first of the PNP, which Portia Simpson Miller ultimately won. Even back then, he, had he succeeded in winning the presidency of the PNP, he might have had a, a more successful time electorally. Yes, I agree. So as, as we kind of bring things down, I uh, just have really, I think we've covered a wide gamut of things, but as we bring things down, there's just one bonus question I really want to look at with Earl, because he's probably the best person to give us this answer. Michael Manley, the way he's revered by the PNP, it's almost, you know, it, it's almost like religious. You know what I mean? It's like it's a religion surrounding the man and his abilities to, his charisma, his ability to captivate people and audience and so on. I don't know much about the man when he was in his heyday. I was, you know, a toddler. So, you know, I can't really say. But what was it about him and what lessons can one learn from his presentation as persons aspiring to leadership, persons aspiring to, you know, make an impact with their target audience. What lessons can they learn from how Michael Manley presented himself and how he was able to sustain and captivate his different audiences at, at yeah. during his time? Well, if, if I may go back to the, the, um, the, the metaphor of the, of the painting or the picture and the frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there was one picture that hardly needed a frame, it was Michael Manley because he had <laughs> so much going for him in terms of his personality, his physical look, his charisma, his intellect. He had so much that was going for him that um, almost by himself, he was like a one person um, PR team. His own, it's like he was his own PR person in terms of his own personal dynamism. But he, did, he took no chance. He actually also gathered around him persons who were very, very competent. I mentioned one of them, Desmond Henry, um, who was an extremely good marketer, 
who became director of tourism, later on headed um, Red Stripes, then D&G's marketing team, I think, at, at one point, uh, among other things. He had, he reached out to the um, artistic community. Many of the well-known figures of Jamaican music, they did songs to Michael Manley or they performed on his bandwagons across Jamaica. So he, then when you, when you listened to him and in terms of his, his ability to deliver a rousing speech, yes. it was hard for anybody to compete with him on that particular platform. So with that, in a sense, for me, sums up a Michael Manley. When Michael Manley died in 1997, Bruce Golding, who was a strong opponent coming from the Jamaica Labour Party, who was part of that very, very intense fight to unseat him in 1980. I think Bruce Golding said of Michael Manley that persons like him come like once in a hundred years. That was the impact of that particular figure of Jamaican mm -hmm. history. So most of those who came before him or who have followed him do not have the sort of complete packaging that Michael Manley came with. Therefore, we now have to get back to ground and deal with the messaging, the packaging, all of those things. I don't know if, I, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, it, it does help. I especially want to, I wanted to talk about it because this was before the era of social media. This was before, you know, when persons can take videos and it's uploaded and in, you know, 10 seconds it's all over the place. It's, I feel like he had the ability to captivate you without any pyrotechnics. I mean, you know, external pyrotechnics. It was all within him, within himself, within his own body, and he just brought it to the fore. So there are lessons clearly to be learned or persons seeking to, or aspiring to leadership are just aspiring to sell themselves and their ideas and connect with audiences that there are very obvious mm -hmm. lessons there that we can learn from Michael Manley and his presentation. Yeah, but by the way, let me just quickly add though that it is, it's not, it wasn't superficial per se. He came from a relatively privileged background. When he came back to Jamaica from his studies in London in the early 1950s, and after that split in 1952 that da did so much damage to the PNP initially, and the um, Trade Union Congress, which was essentially the trade union arm of the PNP, it, it essentially also split from the PNP because it supported those who had been expelled. Michael Manley was asked by his father to go and join the fledgling National Workers' Union, which was established to replace the influence of the TUC. So what happened as a result of that is that Michael Manley then developed a closeness to and appreciation for the common people out in the sugar fields and the banana plantations, etc. And so what, what became very, very organic for him is something that perhaps his own father never was able to, to gain, which was that common touch. So, right. it, so it is true that he took with him um, all of his own personal charisma and intellect, but very importantly as well, an understanding of the ordinary people. Anybody aspiring to leadership in Jamaica today has to develop that common touch. Because I believe in balance. Is there any JLP representative that could be compared in the same way to, to Michael Manley. The person that comes obviously to mind is for me is Bustamante, but uh, you know, I might be way off there. So is there anybody who stacks up? Um, you're not way off in terms of the Bustamante um, comparison in a sense, and as far as um, somebody who attracted the common people. I would say the difference between Bustamante and Michael Manley is that Bustamante was not an intellectual giant and he never pretended to be. Michael Manley was was truly intellectual. Michael Manley knew the arts, he knew, he, he knew um, the, the political theories, he could relate to people in almost any setting. Um, I would say this, that the Bruce Golding of the late 1990s into 2007 mm -hmm. was, ext Bruce Golding is, a, for me, the second most articulate political leader we have had in Jamaica. Bruce Golding's capacity to deliver a rousing speech. It was more studied than Michael Manley's, but it was also very, very effective. He has delivered some of the most effective speeches in terms of Jamaican politics. Okay. 
All right, Carlet, I'm going to give the last thing to you before we last say to you before we switch to the next, uh, closing segment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't follow Earl Moxham. I think that uh, the information that he has redounded on us has been profound. I, I have learned a lot and I appreciate, not just in this context, but every time Mr. Moxham gives insightful information, I, I appreciate that it's history, facts, figures, stats, and context to make the facts, figures, and stats relevant. And I'll leave it right there. It's okay. Right. Thank you, Carlet. All right. So, I mean, based on, uh, let me just try to give a quick summary. Based on what Earl has and looking at the ways in which the presentation, there are, very, there are lessons to be learned. And, you know, unity, number one. Make sure that you, if you are presenting yourself or you as your organization are presenting yourself, make sure that you present a uni unified organization, one that has consistent messaging and there's no question as to how things operate and who's in charge, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that you connect with your audience in a, in a, in a real and meaningful way, because mm -hmm. just like how our politicians aspire to, to connect, and that might involve some energizing, but you have to strike the balance. Give them the information they need, but at the same time making them feel good, making them appreciate and feel energized about how they present the information to you. Am I missing anything, Earl? Am I missing anything, Carlos? I think that's... Oh, yeah, I think that's a good song. Summary. All right. So, yeah. last thing, or I'm just going to ask you, as we say, it's our closing segment, one book, one song, and something else. I'm just going to ask you to share one book, one song, and an experience that you recommend other people try. So, oh, boy. We're we'll putting you on the spot. Yes. Very much, very much so. Let me see. I would say that, in that I've been influenced by so many books, but in terms of a book that many Jamaicans perhaps can find relatable, a book of recent vintage would be August Stone by Kai Miller. I, I think it's mm -hmm. one of the best book by a, a Jamaican author in recent times. Yes. And it, it certainly um, has a lot to recommend it in terms of giving us food for thought about our socioeconomic circumstances and how we treat each other. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of music, I like music that I, I tend to be someone who, um, who go for music that are spiritually uplifting and also that help to raise our social consciousness. If I were to grab one off the top of my head right now, I would say, particularly in the context of our discussion, I would say Equal Rights and Justice by Peter Tosh mm -hmm. is one of those that classic, we should classic, never classic. Um, forget. Um, Experiences. There's so much that there's so many that I, that I could um I could talk about. Mm. Maybe I should just give, give you a, a hint or a foretaste of something that I'm writing about. Mm. Being caught in the so-called Battle of Seattle in 1999, Seattle, Washington, at the WTO conference, which was completely yes. disrupted by demonstrators, and I was caught out on the streets, um in light clothing because I'd expected to be in a warm conference room. Uh -oh. I was left out on the street marching up and down for about eight hours because I couldn't get back to my hotel or into the conference room. I ended up just using the opportunity to interview people and report from out on the streets, but it was bitingly cold. Mm. But I also ran into a, one of the police officers trying to keep order on the streets who, as it turned out, was a Jamaican who used to be from St. Thomas, who used to be in the Jamaica Constabulary Force before he migrated to the United <laughs> States. Who would have thunk it, as they say? Yes. Wow. You said you're writing about it. Where will we be able to see the finished writing? Um, we'll, we'll speak off air. <laughs> <laughs> it's too early to say. <laughs> no All right. No problem. I'm sure it's going to be great. I'm sure it's going to give yes, us lots of fun. And I'm sure we're going to enjoy it. All right, guys, I think that's where we're going to end today's show. Thank you to everybody who watched. Uh, thank you for staying tuned. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And remember to share with anyone you think might, might enjoy it. Until next time, take care. Thank you and bye-bye.